This is my continuation in a series of videos meant to support a course I'm teaching in introductory proof writing. And today we're finally ready to start proving things using the direct method of proof. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the hierarchy of mathematical results, as well as different structures of these mathematical results. So this is by in no way a complete taxonomy of mathematical results, but this at least gets you off the ground. So maybe most very important math results are called theorems. And all theorems have been proven true. So even though they're called theorems, which sounds like theory, well, just like in science, theories are generally accepted to be true because there's lots of evidence supporting them. In math, theorems are true. Well, they've been proven to be true. That's one of the great things about math is there's no doubt whether or not something is true or false because it all follows from logic. So like I said, these are like the most important type of results. Then next, you've got propositions. Sometimes these have different names as well, observations or other things. And these are less important theorems. So maybe they are almost good enough to be theorems, but they're not quite as interesting. So I have a dotted line between theorems and propositions because sometimes you'll use the result of a theorem to prove a proposition and vice versa. Okay, then next, we've got the idea of a corollary. And this is a result that follows immediately from a theorem or a proposition. So often there is no proof given in a textbook for corollaries. Um, sometimes the proof is left as an exercise. And as you see while working through the exercise, it's really quite short built off of whatever theorem or proposition it is a corollary to. So I've got an arrow going from theorem and proposition to corollary to show that this follows from these two. Next, we've got this idea of a lemma. So a lemma is a mathematical result where it's true, but the most interesting thing about it is that it's really helpful to prove a theorem or a proposition. So you might prove this as like a starting result to make the proof of the proposition or the theorem a little bit more elegant. Now, there are some really, really famous things that are called lemmas, but they're not really lemmas, like Zorn's lemma and stuff like that, but we're not really gonna talk about this. This is generally the picture. And then finally, we've got this notion of a conjecture. And so a conjecture is something that is unproven, but there is evidence to think that it is true, like the Goldbach conjecture or maybe like for Miles' last theorem before it was proven, you know, about 20 years ago now. So what I mean by evidence, maybe there's some numerical evidence with some calculations, or maybe some other very, very similar results have been proven to be true, or something like that. So generally, when you get in the upper tier of math, finding the conjectures is maybe one of the more important things and then obviously proving those conjectures. Okay, so now that we've got this idea of a hierarchy of mathematical results, let's look at the structure of some theorems, propositions, and so on and so forth. So let's get rid of this so we can look at that. Now that we've looked at the hierarchy of mathematical results, we wanna look at different wordings of mathematical results. So I'm gonna just say the structure of theorems. Well, this could be theorems, propositions, lemmas, corollaries, so on and so forth. So this is by no means a full list, but this will get us started proving theorems in the first place at least. So the first are conditional statements, and that's what we'll start with proving later in this video. And so those are of the form P implies Q, and often they're written like if P then Q. So in other words, if statement P is true, then statement Q is also true. And here's an example. So this is the mean value theorem from calculus one. So if f is continuous on closed interval a, b, and differentiable on open interval a, b, then there is a c on the open interval such that f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So this is a conditional statement. We have an if p then q format. The p is this bit that I'm gonna underline in blue. So notice the p is a compound statement. F is continuous and differentiable. But then the q brings about the existence of this c and then the c satisfies this rule with the derivative. 
So let's maybe color code these as well. So here we have P implies Q, P, Q. Great. So now we also have these things called biconditional statements, and these are if and only if statements. So we read this as P if and only if Q, or written out in words P if and only if Q, sometimes shortened to P I F F Q. So IFF is a shortening of if and only if. Here's a simple biconditional statement. N, which is an integer, is odd if and only if N squared is odd. So I'll let you guys think about what is playing the role of P and Q here, but I think this one's a bit simpler to decode than the first one that we looked at. And finally, there are theorems which are not conditional or biconditional statements. They're really just facts. And so here's an example. So I've named it theorem, and then we use this wording we have, and then here's a formula. So this is the famous Basil's problem. The sum of the reciprocal of the squares is equal to pi squared over six. So now that we've seen the hierarchy of theorems and some structure of theorems, we're going to prove a couple very simple results using the method of direct proof. But before we do that, I want to recall some basic definitions that we can use just so that we have some tools in order to do calculations. So the first one is the notion of divisibility. So for A and B in the integers, we say A divides B and we write, write A and then this vertical line B, so that's A divides B. If there is a K which is an integer such that B is A times K. In other words, B is a multiple of A. The next, N is said to be even if it's divisible by two, so that's pretty straightforward. And then that means we can write it as two times some other number. So if we're talking about something that's even, often we will immediately write it as twice some other number. Then in that same vein, we have n is odd if it is not divisible by two. So I've written that like this with this cross through the divisibility symbol. But that means we can write n as 2m plus one for some integer m. Okay, so now that we have some basic tools at hand, let's prove some things using the method of direct proof. Before we do our first proofs, let's look at a basic outline for a direct proof of a conditional statement. So let's say we've got this theorem that says if P then Q, where P and Q are both mathematical statements. So all proofs using this direct proof method, especially the simple ones, follow a general outline. So your first line should be something like suppose P, and your last line should be something like thus Q, or you know something like that, therefore Q. And then everything in the middle is what bridges the logical gap from P to Q. So like I said here, it's a careful argument that could include decoding some definitions, like the definition of continuity and differentiability, like from our example before, or the definition of an odd number, like our other example before. You might have to do some calculations and then here I've just put magic. That's kind of a joke, but sometimes you'll just have to play around with it. All proofs are different, and there's not really one outline that works for everything. But the, the main idea here is that this is all logical steps taking you from the if part of the if-then statement to the then part of the if-then statement. Okay, so let's get rid of this and we'll do some examples. So for our first example, we're gonna prove that if n is even, then n squared is also even. So our p statement is n is even, and our q statement is n squared is even. So this has the form if p, then q. And like we're doing in this whole video, we're gonna use the method of direct proof. So let's suppose our starting bit. So let's suppose that n is even. In other words, we're supposing that P is true. Now we want to decode this using the definition of an even number. So I'll do it like this. So N equals two times M for some M, which is an integer. And that's using our basics over here of the definition of an even integer. So we've decoded it using the definition. Now we're ready to do some calculation. So maybe I'll use some wording like this. So notice that n squared, well, that's going to be equal to 2m quantity squared, but that's equal to 4m squared, but that's equal to 2 times 2m squared. 
So we've written n squared as two times another number, which is exactly the definition of an even number. So n squared is even. So notice here we have suppose n is even, suppose p is true. We have our calculation, including our decoding via the definition, and we have our Q statement down here, which we have shown follows from our P statement. So that's the end of this proof. Okay, let's do another. So let's look at this next one. If N is divisible by six, then it is divisible by two and three. So notice our Q statement here is compound. So that means we actually need to show two things. We need to show that if N is divisible by six, then it's divisible by two. And if n is divisible by six, then it's divisible by three. But we can kind of do most of that calculation all at once. So let's see how that goes. So let's suppose n is divisible by six. But using the definition of divisibility up here, we know that that means that n is equal to six times k for some integer k. And now we'll notice two very simple calculations. So notice that n is equal to two times three k and n is equal to three times two k. That's just by the factorization of six. But now this one implies that n is divisible by two and this one is exactly the definition of n being divisible by three. So maybe we could finish this off by thus, n is divisible by two and three. That's really all you need for this proof. Okay, we're gonna do about two more. Next, we're gonna prove a property of divisibility. So if A divides B and B divides C, then A divides C. So we've got the if P then Q statement. But now our P statement is compound, so we've got two things to start with. So let's jump into the proof. So let's suppose that A divides B and B divides C. Now using the definition of divisibility, that means we can rewrite B in terms of A and C in terms of B. So maybe we'll write it like this. So B equals A times N and C equals B times M for m and n, which are integers. So that's the definition of a dividing b, that's the definition of b dividing c. But now we can just do some simple substitution. So we can substitute this value of b into this equation, which involves c. So maybe we'll use the language, notice that C equals, well, I'm gonna write B times M, but that's equal to A times N times M. But now we know something about the associativity of multiplication, so that's equal to A times MN. So we've got C equals A times some other number, but that's exactly what we need to say that A divides C. And that finishes this proof. Okay, let's do one more. So now we're gonna look at our last little result. So it's got a little bit of a setup. So before we get into the conditional statement, we want to suppose that X and Y are positive real numbers. Now we're ready to look at the conditional statement. If X is less than or equal to Y, then X cubed is less than or equal to Y cubed. Okay, so let's maybe see how this can go. So let's suppose that X is less than or equal to Y. So that's like, suppose that P is true, but now we want to decode this into maybe something that's a little bit easier to do arithmetic with. So notice that if X is less than or equal to Y, that means Y minus X is bigger than or equal to zero. So maybe we'll say, so Y minus X is bigger than or equal to zero. You can think about this as being the definition of X is less than or equal to Y. Now next, we'll multiply both sides of this inequality by something that is positive. And it's important that it's positive so that it does not change the direction of the inequality. So maybe let's include that as a notice. So let's notice that x squared plus xy plus y squared is strictly bigger than zero. 
And that's because we're starting with positive real numbers in the first place. So if we combine them like that, we're gonna get a positive real number. Then we can multiply both sides of that inequality by this left-hand term, and it will not change the direction of the inequality. So let's maybe do that. We have y minus x times, I'll change the order of this just so that it looks a little bit more familiar. y squared plus xy plus x squared is bigger than or equal to zero. But now if you look at the left-hand side of this, this is the standard factorization for a difference of cubes. So that means when we multiply it out, we'll have y cubed minus x cubed is bigger than or equal to zero. That's just from multiplying out the left-hand side of that inequality. And then we can finish this off by changing y cubed minus x cubed bigger than or equal to zero to x cubed is less than or equal to y cubed, which is exactly where we wanted to end. And that's a good place to stop.